well, this is what I thought. I thought that Emma Lazarus would come to me in a dream. I thought that one night, after a long day's work poring over her letters, reading the New York Times on microfilm, combing the archives of, of obscure 19th century Jewish organizations, that she'd come and tell me everything. She would tell me about her childhood in the 1850s, about her wealthy Sephardic family, her father, mother, and six siblings, about her family's Jewish observance, about which we know very little, where they were during the draft riots of 1863, when rioters filed past her house to set fire to the Colored Orphans Asylum. She'd tell me about her life as an activist, as an advocate for refugees, an advocate for a Jewish state in Palestine. Her life in letters as a lyric poet, dramatist, essayist, and critic, and her life as America's first public cultural Jew, and whether she felt isolated or saw the glimmerings of a community which is now very familiar to us, and what she felt like facing anti-Semitic innuendo, how she managed to bear criticism from both traditional and reformed Jews. I thought she'd fill me in on suitors that I hadn't even known existed and told me about the man she called my fate, for whom she waited up all night at a soiree and who never showed up. And maybe she would clear up the mystery of her relationship with the non-Jewish poet and gadabout Charles Decay. Did he reciprocate her intense interest and affection? And what did he do that made her so furious that telegrams about her wrath were sent across the Berkshires to Albany, down the Hudson, to Charles Decay in New York to warn him she was coming back. And why she never married? Was it her wealth? Was it disappointment? Was it sexuality? But as biographers know, one subject does not come to one in a dream. Instead, Emma Lazarus came alive for me in a sequence of moments sometimes in her poems, sometimes in her letters, sometimes without her even speaking at all. And today I'd like to tell you about some of these revelatory moments. Her sister Josephine's memoir, written in a scrim of grief shortly after Emma's death in 1887, says that the Civil War, quote, inspired her first lyric outbursts. But this was far from true. Between the ages of 14 and 17, Emma Lazarus wrote over 200 pages of poems and translations from French, German, and Italian. These were published privately by her father under the title Poems, by a young poet, poems and Translations by a Young Poet Written Between the Ages of 14 and 17, <laughs> um, her father taking paternal pride to Olympian heights. Um, but at the end of the war, when she was 15, she wrote a few surprising poems that helped me to know her much better. April 1st, 1865 was the Battle of Five Forks, which was the last Confederate offensive of the war. Her father's friend, Brevet Brigadier General Frederick Winthrop, was killed in this battle. And Emma wrote a sort of elegy for him. And here's a stanza. More hearts will break than gladden when the bitter struggles passed. A giant form of victory must a giant's shadow cast. And I saw in this small stanza a hint of the iconoclasm that would become her trademark. In the days following Lincoln's assassination, when poets and elegists and eulogists all over the country were writing verses in memory of the martyred president, Emma Lazarus did something quite different. She wrote a poem spoken in the voice of the cornered John Wilkes Booth, who, as you may remember, was hiding in a farmhouse in Virginia, and the Union um, soldiers set fire to it to smoke him out. And she wrote about him cowering in this farmhouse. She followed this up with a poem spoken in the voice of his bereaved mother who had a double loss because not only had her son been killed, but his grave was completely unknown. No one knew where his body had been laid to rest. 
I think her most interesting poem following the Civil War came a couple of years later. It's called Heroes. I'm going to read an excerpt to you. In rich Virginia woods, the scarlet creeper reddens over graves among the solemn trees and looped with vines. Heroic spirits haunt the solitudes, the noble souls of half a million braves amid the murmurous pines. I like that stanza, I like the murmurous pines, but it begins rather conventionally and then takes a turn. Ah, who is left behind, earnest and eloquent, sincere and strong, to consecrate their memories with words, not all unmeet, with fitting dirge and song, to chant a requiem purer than the wind and sweeter than the birds. Who has sung their praises, not less illustrious, who are living yet? Armies of heroes, satisfied to pass from the whole world's gaze, calmly, serenely, and cheerfully accept without regret their old life as it was, with all its petty pains, its irritating littleness and care. They who have scaled the mountain with content sublime descend to live upon the plain, steadfast as though they breathed the mountain air still wheresoever they went. They who were brave to act and rich enough their action to forget, who having filled their day with chivalry, withdraw and keep their simpleness intact and all unconscious add more luster yet unto their victory. Ellen Emerson, the daughter of Ralph Waldo Emerson, had the poem read to her by her father. And she said, the word is true, and it's the first time it's been said in America. In this poem, I see Emma Lazarus thinking beyond the pieties and the icons to embrace the ordinary, the heroism of being ordinary and loving ordinary life, embracing the abject, embracing what's common to humanity. In other words, I see this as a very modern poem. Her relationship